Hey, what's up everyone? So I've been off work for the last week, had a pretty major gum surgery all across the bottom and top. It sucks. Been on a liquid diet for the last week now, but I'm slowly getting back to the point where I can actually talk, which is cool. And I've been going through my computer, looking at some old footage, and I come across a GoPro video that I did a few months back that was actually tied into, you may remember this video here, where we had a trouble call where the pole made contact with the primary, and I'd mentioned that a lot of the lines were coming out. So there is a backstory to that, and we actually have the GoPro footage for the backstory. So we're gonna take a look at that. It's something I didn't originally post, because as you're gonna see shortly, everything we did up in the air was totally not up to standard. We basically made temporary repairs working in energized conditions. It's actually a pretty interesting setup. So we're gonna be taking a look at that right now. So you can see the broken cutout hanging there. That left side is energized and the other two phases are still energized. And they feed this transformer bank right here which is transferred over to a new pole that's leaning over. Pretty, pretty rough shape. That's not a, that's not a nice looking structure at all. So to take an interruption on this line and fix things up properly, we'd have to dump the whole three phase line. If we look behind us, the three phase, there's no cutouts in the corner pole and that just carries on right back onto the main feeder. So normally these, these side lines have a disconnect out at the road. Like I said already, it's 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 not a it's not a standard setup, not a good setup at all. So instead of taking an interruption and knocking out power to the area, there's there's a bunch of other farms in this line. Um, it's Monday after a stormy weekend. We I really don't want to take out power if we don't have to. The end of the cross arm. It was tracking through that, going down through the, the brace as that cutout was, was leaking. So after talking both to the farmer and then confirming with the office, there had already been a project in the works to have this structure, the one with the transformers on it. In fact, this entire line was coming out, hence why that new pole was set in the other video, which was gonna have the new dead end transformer bank set out in the road, some quadrex run into the structure. So at this point in the video, we've already spoke with our dispatch and let them know the plan. We've got a radial permit from this structure, from the switches on this pole to the end of the line, which is just one span over to the right where the transformers are. So first thing we want to do before we actually take our permit, put the grounds on, is remove this hazard right here, which is a three foot long energized lead blowing around in the wind. So that's definitely the, the first step in any job to identify, control, remove the hazards. We're also going to lift the tap on the other two cutouts. That way there's no chance of any of the voltage tracking through the existing porcelain until we can get a closer look. So luckily, these guys are coming off pretty easily. Sometimes they'll get seized on and you have to use hotline cutters to remove them. But we're not really in a coastal area here, so there's not a whole lot of corrosion or anything. So we just remove the taps. And you can see I kind of tug them straight down so they're not springing back up into the live stuff. But once, once I get going, I'm not gonna be anywhere near that side of the structure. I did also remove the cutout door from the center phase. Not sure why I didn't remove the far one to be honest, but it's okay where I did lift the tap. So if by chance it were to swing shut, it's not like it's gonna energize the line I'm working on. I guess I probably removed that center one where it's gonna be a lot closer to my work area just so I don't knock into it. But our next step now is to check for potential and install our grounds. So 
we're doing this for a few reasons. What you're seeing on the screen right now is our proximity indicator. It, uh, we're just checking for voltage. It's, it just picks up the magnetic field, depending on the setting. I believe I got it set at 12 or 15 kVA for this line. So we're cross-referencing it with the live side here, just to make sure that our potential indicator is working. That's why it beeped on the live side. And then we're going to check each of the three phases on the dead side. So, as I just mentioned, we're, we're putting grounds on this side for a couple different reasons. One is to prevent any back feed. It is a farm we're working on. They definitely have generators. So, if, if a generator is back feeding up into that line, those, those grounds will take care of that generator pretty quick. It's, uh, there's also going to be zero difference of potential between any of those three phases and the neutral. If, if I was on hooks right now, it's, it's not a good idea to be putting that initial duct bill on the neutral by hand, unless of course you already have your, your bonding bracket put on the pole, between the pole and the neutral, working out of the bucket, that's, that's fine. So we're gonna ground the phase nearest us and work our way in just basically going from phase to phase as we ground here. And the other reason for installing these grounds, it's basically procedure-wise, I am going to be going hands-on those, those lines. So ideally, once I get up into the workspace, it's almost more of a hazard having energized lines on one side of the structure and grounded lines on the other. However, if they weren't grounded, then I, I can't go hands-on. So we have to be very conscientious the entire time that we're working that there's grounded phases, which are at ground potential on one side of the structure and energized at 7,200 volts on the other. You want to make sure when you're installing your grounds that you do put them on the phase that's already grounded. Like here, the center phase is already grounded. You don't want to accidentally hang on the live phase, and you're going to basically have an energized duck bill dangling around. Make sure that they're open all the way before you go and tap those on the wire. You also don't want to tease the duck bow when you put it on. If, if by chance something happened that energized that phase in between you checking potential, you, you don't want to tease it and get an arc flash. If, if that were energized and you snap that on quick, whatever caused that to be energized, it'll, it'll look after it pretty quick. There'll be minimal arcing if you can throw that duck bill on there faster than, than not. So now this is this is the live side of things here. Our clearances as certified linemen are I'm not sure what I'm doing right there. But our, our clearances are two foot one inches from our distribution voltage. Unless of course you have a barrier. So we've got a few barriers in this case, one being I'm in an insulated boom truck, the other I'm wearing my 20 kV last two rubber gloves and what we're going to be doing now is actually covering up that entire face with hard cover up as well as some rubber cover up so this this here I'm putting on right now is a tap clamp I'm, I'm just putting that tap clamp on because the hard cover up I'm about to install will slide away from the structure so we're just putting that on so the hard cover up doesn't slide outside of the work area this piece of hard cover up is rated for 46,000 volts that's in ideal conditions, of course, when it's clean. Easiest way to put these guys on, this this is only number two ACSR, so it should slide on pretty easy, but if it was bigger wire, if it was 556 or something, you're going to want to slide it as you put a down pressure. You can see I've got my tap clamp a little bit close here, so I don't have a whole lot of room to slide it back and forth. But again, it's only number two ACSR, so it does pop into place quite easily. If, if that were bigger wire, I would have slid it in place first from probably about six feet away from the structure. 
and then put the tap clamp in place. The sag was quite low here, so I was worried about it sliding away outside of my work area. So we're just going to loosen that tap clamp up and snug it in a little tighter. Keep that hard cover up as close to the work area as possible. So once once we have all of our barriers in place, the uh, primary is all covered up. We have our rubber gloves. We're working out of an insulated boom. We're allowed basically to go up to but not touching the live face, which which is really what I need here. I need that cover up because when I go and install that cutout on that broken cross arm, I'm going to be extremely close to the live stuff. So this this rubber cover up we're putting on now. It can be put on with sticks. There's there's holes in it put on with sticks, as you can see. It didn't struggle too much. But ideally, this stuff's designed to be put on by hand. Same with this blanket. There's holes on it. You can work with a stick easy enough. But normally, in a situation like this, we'd go back to the substation and remove the reclosing from, from the recloser. Basically, we call that a hold off, and then we can go hands on the line. This is a rubber glove truck, so if I had a hold off, I could go hands on the line. It'd make this a whole lot easier but for the five or ten minutes it took to put this stuff on with a stick it was a lot quicker than driving to the substation to get a hold off so this is interesting the clothespins some guys don't realize this but the clothespins come with those metal rings through them those rings are so you can put them on with a hot stick once once you put it in the end of your grab ball suck it tight it'll hold that clothespin open you can drop it over the blanket and release your grab ball and that clothespin will snap shut. But I, I do still have a bare spot. You can see there's about two inches of wire still showing. Definitely want to get that covered up. So we're going to take our bucket stick and lift that up and over the other piece of rubber. And then we're going to grab another clothespin to lock that down in place. When, when you're covering up lines with rubber, there's, there's never a situation that's good enough. You, you don't want to have any exposed wire whatsoever. It only it only takes a pinhole for that 7200 volts to go through. If I'm holding on to the work permit side of that structure and reach across and, and hit an exposed spot of that primary, I mean, I, I still have my rubber gloves as, as another barrier, but still then at that point, you're doing what's called testing your gloves. You're, you're testing to make sure there's no pinholes in your gloves too, which is, which is a big no-no when doing rubber glove work. So now we're just cutting off that burnt section of our arm. It's, it's not impacting the integrity of this double arm structure at all because we still do have that DA bolt going through both arms. So that's just the end piece where the cutout was initially hanging from. We're going to get that guy out of the way. And basically the plan is going to be just to mount the cutout on the back portion of the arm. It's going to be a little close, so we're going to use an extended bracket for the cutout. That'll push the cutout out away from that cross arm. And again, it's important to note that this this is a very temporary setup. So this is something we don't use much anymore at all. Our hydraulic impact gun. We've got a Milwaukee bit in there. We actually use the Milwaukee battery drills for pretty well everything now. That way you're not fighting with the hoses tangled up in your bucket. And here's our cutout with an extended bracket to kick that out past that cross arm, which would be considered ground. You don't want to have the live part of that cutout too close to the ground or to anything that's of the different potential, really. Just snug that guy up. I left the cutout loose on the end so that I could steer it away from the live phase there. Even though it's covered up, you still don't you don't want to be hitting up against it and, and testing it. And then as we tighten it down, we, we left it angled out away from the line a little bit. Now this guy here, you gotta be careful. That broken porcelain, you can see I'm just handling from the top of the porcelain. That's extremely sharp. It can it can cut your gloves quite easily. That's why I, I do like these rubber glove covers. They are Kevlar lined. So I did a video 
probably two or three years ago now where we actually took a razor blade and sliced the gloves and it didn't make it all the way through to the rubber. So they're, they're a very good glove protector for working with sharp objects. And right here, we're just brushing that copper. It's corroded quite a bit. The shiny copper's brown, kind of green color now. You want to have that, that shiny copper color going into any connections. So we're just going to tighten that up where we're real, real close to that high voltage there now. We're just going to use hand tools moving forward. Some guys ask about torque and connections like this. It's, I don't think I've ever seen a lineman use a torque wrench on a cutout, but it would be about 45 foot pounds. Putting in the top lead now with the tap clamp on it. You have to be especially careful with this because that lead's probably about three feet long. You don't want to be swinging it away. So you notice I have the loose side dangling towards my bucket. Definitely don't want to have that dangling over on the live side of things. So we've got that guy snugged up. And that's pretty much it. We're ready to take our rubber off and uh, put the tap clamps back on, energize those cutouts, close this guy back in. So removing our clothespins first, one by one, making sure we don't drop our blanket. You want, you want to be extremely careful with your, your rubber that you don't lose control of that stuff and let it fall to the ground or even slide off the conductor on any sharp edges. If, if you get any cuts on that blanket whatsoever, it's, it's basically no longer usable. You can see the condition of the rubber. It's, we keep it extremely clean. There's no dirt on it. It's, it's regularly washed at the office and stored in rubber bins on the truck. And removing our dead end cover. And last but not least, our hard cover up, our 46 kV piece. Those, those soft rubber pieces are rated for 36 and that hard cover up's rated for 46,000 volts. So we're just removing the tap clamp this time to make it a little easier to pop off. These, these lines are quite slack. They're only number two ACSR. Last thing you want to do when removing this cover up is slap those phases together, make quite, a, quite an art flash. So as you put a little bit of an upward pressure on it, you just slide her back and forth and she'll pop off pretty easily. If, you, if you're having a whole lot of trouble, you can go up above the phases and flip it upside down and push down and away from you. And another technique is to use a second stick and actually hold the face, which the fella can do from the ground with the telly stick if you wanted to. So just hang the cutout doors. This part doesn't really matter what point you do it. I definitely wouldn't go tapping those cutouts on while the grounds are still on. But uh, for some reason I chose to hang the doors before removing the grounds. So when you remove, you remove your grounds, you want to remove them basically in the reverse order from how you install them, starting from the phase furthest from you and working your way back. I'm just grabbing the loose end so it doesn't swing up into that other live phase there. These grounds, they're also tested annually. And regardless of them being tested annually, you do have to inspect them before each and every use for, for any corrosion or if they're starting to seize up. Each, each ground actually has an expiry date marked on the ground itself. So now that our, our ground's been removed, we can tap our leads on. You want to be careful when you're tapping your leads that, that that lead doesn't go up into any grounded pointed structure, basically the other side of that epoxylator, which there's not a whole lot of room, but enough that I'm not too overly worried about it here. I, th I think I end up readjusting one of the leads, probably the center lead here. 
we're not picking up any load. There's no lightning arresters on these switches, so we're not picking up any load whatsoever. When you when you do tighten these tap clamps on, you basically screw them clockwise. And as soon as you get any resistance at all, resistance, you got to give it a little flick so that seats the stirrup in into the, the saddle of the tap clamp. If you don't give it that little flick, then it'll bite slightly sideways. So you can see here, I'm just pulling that lead away from the line a little bit. And just before tapping the last one on, I did notice the stirrup had a little bit of corrosion on it. So a lot of these. Lime and knives fit right into your grab ball. So we're just brushing off a little bit of that corrosion that's on the stirrup. And you can see the lead has a bit of a coil in it. The, when the boys made up the lead, they weren't sure the exact length where the structure is coming down. I wasn't overly concerned about the aesthetics of uh, having a lead that was a little bit too long. But uh, ideally, you do want to measure your leads to do all the exact length. If you do leave a coil in the lead, it can cause some some issues with uh, with an, I think it's called inductive reactants. And last thing we're doing, just before grabbing the stick and going up and closing the line in, might as well get rid of some of this stuff. Give the boys something to do on the ground while I'm going up and closing things in. You can see right beside my partner that tube on the ground that's uh, the rubber blanket rolls up and goes into that tube and where it is uh, a radial permit basically meaning there is no alternate feed for the side that's grounded we don't have to talk to our dispatcher before closing in when we, when we take the permit we have permission to both carry out the work and energize the line once we're complete and then we can let our dispatch know that the work is complete. So right now we're energizing the line. The customer does have their main break breaker open so there's not a single spark coming off this. We're, we're not picking up anything. We're just energizing basically up to the transformers and into his main breaker which once it's ready we'll do a voltage check and he'll close his main breaker back in. So you can see also I do look away from them regardless. Just, just in case, I mean, there's only one span here. It's not likely that they're going to blow for any reason, but if they do, you'd rather be staring at the ground when they blow and not looking directly at the switch. So everything we just saw in that video, guys, is now gone, dismantled. The crews went back and built a new transformer bank out on the main road and brought a secondary feed using Quadrex in through the back of the farm. So customer's happy. I'm happy. You're happy. I hope. And we were able to capture some good footage. Still totally bummed that I botched that footage of the pole fire where we replaced the top whole section of the pole with a fiberglass extension. I will be sure to cover that again next time I get the chance. It doesn't happen overly often, but basically I have 360 cam. And when I shifted the settings from 360 to front lens, I actually shifted it to the back lens and just recorded this guy the whole time. Super bummed from that. But one last thing before we go, guys. Uh, as most of you know, we were at the Milwaukee Pipeline a couple weeks ago. The stuff that they're releasing, it's, it's incredible. There's a few things I can't talk about yet on video, but they were showing us some tools with a whole new level of, of technology and, and power. But I am going on a conference call with Milwaukee next week to talk about a few of their products. So I want you guys to let me know in the comments, especially in the line trade, any, any tools or equipment that you feel don't exist in the lithium battery world for Lyman tools and equipment, let me know. I'd love to share that with them. Milwaukee's an absolute amazing company for working with its customers as to what it is that you guys want. Recently, I have been trying out their top handle saw, which I'm confident in getting rid of my gas saw. In fact, I don't even need gasoline on my truck at all now. These lithium battery tools now are not only powerful enough, but they'll last throughout the entire shift. Pretty much cut anything you want. And we did also get in their new red lithium forged batteries, which the 6.0 amp hour batteries have just as much output and power as the previous 12.0 amp hour battery. 
And it comes with a supercharger that charges these batteries up to 80% within 15 minutes. So with a supercharger and two batteries, you can go all night with this chainsaw. So it's not something that I ask of you guys often, but if you could maybe subscribe to the channel and like if you find any use for my videos, it's greatly appreciated. I've got lots of great stuff coming up. We're back to work on Monday and we'll see you guys all soon.